Good morning to our listeners on Parliament Radio 105.5 FM, our viewers on the Parliament Channel, and those of you joining us via the World Wide Web on the Parliament's website, www.ttparliament.org. We are less than two minutes away from 10 a.m. and the start of today's sitting of the Senate. This will be the 14th sitting of the Senate in the first session of this 11th Parliament. On the agenda today, we expect debate to begin on the Finance Variation of Appropriation Financial Year 2016 Bill. Of course, debate on a motion to adopt the second report of the Standing Finance Committee of the House of Representatives would have been considered on Friday, and this same bill would have been taken through all of its stages and voted on in the early morning uh, of Saturday. And now it is the Senate's turn to consider the bill. So we expect uh, a lengthy debate today uh, with members from all benches taking part. And we'll be here on the Parliament Channel to cover it all. you to the 14th sitting of the Senate in the first session of the 11th Parliament that takes place on Tuesday, April 12th, 2016. Let us pray. Almighty God, we willingly acknowledge you as the supreme being, most gracious and most merciful. Look down, we beseech you and us who are members of this Senate and deign to assist us in the duties that we have to perform on behalf of our beloved country of Trinidad and Tobago. Open our eyes to see the truth and help us to accept it with all its implications into our lives. Direct us, O Lord, in our deliberations so that setting aside private interests, unwholesome prejudices and personal affections, we may treat all matters set before us with honesty, courage and conviction. Through all we say and do in this Senate, may we give glory and honor to your holy name, inspire confidence in our fellow citizens, and make a positive contribution to the peace and prosperity of our nation. Amen. <clears throat> Announcements by the President. Honorable Senators, I have received the following correspondence from the Speaker of the House. Dear President of the Senate, Change of Membership, Joint Select Committee on Social Services and Public Administration. At a sitting held on Friday, April the 1st, 2016, the House of Representatives agreed to the following resolution. Resolved that Mr. Esmond Ford be appointed to serve on the Joint Select Committee on Social Services and Public Administration in lieu of Mr. Terence Dialsing. Accordingly, I respectfully request you inform the Senate of this matter at the earliest convenience. Thank you. Respectfully, Bridget Mary Anisette George, Speaker. Bills brought from the House of Representatives as listed on the supplemental order paper, the Finance Variation of Appropriation, Financial Year 2016, Bill 2016, in the name of the Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Madam President, in accordance with Standing Order 62.1B, I beg to move that the next stage of the bill be taken later in the proceedings. Honorable Senators, the question is that the next stage of the bill be taken later in the proceedings. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Papers. 
Minister of Finance. Madam President, I have the honor to lay on the table the following papers as listed on the order paper in my name. The reports of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the financial statements of the Institute of Marine Affairs for the years ended September 30th, 2008 and 2009. The audited financial statements of the National Commission for Self-Help Limited for the financial year ended September 30th, 2014. The annual, annual audited financial statements of the sports company of Trinidad and Tobago Limited for the financial years ended September 30th, 2014 and 2015. The annual audited financial statements of Evolving Technologies and Enterprise Development Company Limited year ended September 30th, 2010. The annual report of the Trinidad and Tobago Securities and Exchange Commission for the year ended September 30th, 2015. Your government business. Madam President, I have the honor to lay on the table the following papers as listed on the order paper and supplemental order paper in my name and in the names of the Minister of Community Development, Culture and the Arts, the Minister of Housing and Urban Development, and the Prime Minister. <coughs> as follows, the administrative reports of the Princess Town Regional Corporation for the periods 2011 to 2012 and 2012 to 2013, <coughs> The annual administrative report of the Ministry of the Arts and Multiculturalism for the period October 1st, 2012 to September 30th, 2013. The Trinidad and Tobago Housing Development Corporation vesting amendment to the first schedule number two order 2016. And finally, the annual report and financial statements of the Children's Authority of Trinidad and Tobago for the year ending September 30th, 2015. Urgent questions? Senator Mark. To the Minister of Rural Development and Local Government, could the Minister state how much money is owed to employees and service providers attached to the Rural Development Company for the period January to March 2016, and how soon this will be paid? Madam President, through you, the Rural Development Company has been experiencing some cash flow problems since January. As a result, we have applied to the Ministry of Finance for a subvention on the recurrent expenditure, and the release should be available by the end of this week. Madam President, through you, the RDC earns its income from management fees for projects undertaken by government. Recently, by a cabinet decision, the Rural Development Company was appointed project managers for the Maruga Fishing Facility at an estimated cost of $200 million. The management fee of 5% will amount to $5 million, which will easily cover the operating expense for this year and probably for this first half of 2017. Specific answer to the question in terms of what are the outstanding um, monies owed to employees and service providers from January, February and March, the total service provider, a mere $59,274, to the staff, $352,553, and directors, $202,500 making it a total of $614,327. All these payments will easily be made before the end of April. Questions on notice? Madam President, I, I just would like to inform this Senate that the government will be answering all questions today. Senator Mark. Question number 31 to the Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Thank you, Madam President. During the period 1st October 2015 to 30th November 2015, Lake Asphalt of Trinidad and Tobago 1978 Limited made donations to the following non-governmental organizations. 
Venture Credit Union of 32 Southern Main Road, Coover. The Inner Circle of Jesus Christ of Robertson Street, San Fernando. Simple Connection of 12 and a half mile mark, Komuto Main Road, Coryal. Point Fortin Sports Training of Point Fortin. Southwest Improvement Committee, Bungalow 140 in Prescott and Faisabad. The Brother Jerome Foundation, 32 to 34 Coffee Street, San Fernando. Southwest Improvement Organization, Bungalow 140 in Prescott and Faisabad. United Praise Agency, number 13, Bellevue Street, St. Madeline Village. Birdland Sports and Cultural, Light Pole, number 28, Newlands La Brea. Ike Waldron, 32 Lotus Drive, Thompson Gardens, Palmyra, and Southwest Improvement Organization, Bungalow 114, Press Camp Faisabad. Thank you. Senator Mark. Question number 32 to the Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Thank you, Madam President. No donations were granted by Libidco to non-governmental organization in the period October 1st, 2015 to November 30th, 2015. Senator Mark. Question number 33 to the Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Thank you. There were no donations by Trinidad Generation Unlimited in November 2015. In the month of October 2015, TGU made the following donations. To St. Augustine Anglican Church of New Jersey Libre, the Libre Community Council of Point Door Libre, Holy Name Convent Secondary School of Capdeville Point Fortin, the Libre Youth Club of Point Door Libre, Vessany Secondary School of Vessany Libre, Friends of the Point Fortin Library, to Capdeville Main Road, Point Fortin. Seven Fitness Challenge of 78 Warden Road, Point Fortin. St. Michael Spiritual Baptist Church, number eight, Pierre Road, Le Bray. Laurentia Motors Early Childhood Center, 71 High Street, New Village, Point Fortin. The Outreach Underprivileged Children in the Community, number 12, Poucher Street, San Fernando. Libre Black Gold Seniors of Point Door Libre and Anglican Church, New Jersey Libre. Thank you. Senator, Senator Amin. Question number 48 to the Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. No. Question number 49 to the Minister of Public Administration. As promised during the debate on the appropriation bill last year, a high priority of the government is the deployment of free public Wi-Fi in popular areas. The Ministry of Public Administration and Communications is working in close collaboration with the telecom Telecommunications Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, the National Information and Communications Technology Company Limited, IGovTT, and other stakeholders on this important initiative. We expect to deliver the first pilot phase of the Wi-Fi initiative no later than the end of July 2016. Among the benefits to citizens and businesses will be increased access to government information and services. Thank you. Supplemental. Supplemental. Can the minister indicate which areas, geographic areas in the country, you intend to uh, pilot or have the first set of uh, Wi-Fi available? Madam President, the intention is that the initiative will target the areas that are not presently served by the um, established providers. I, I, I don't want to give the names yet because we are still working on it. Senator Amin. Question number 50 to the Minister of Education. Okay. 
Madam President, the cut in budgetary allocation for the school dietary program is not expected to impact on the number of meals required by schools, nor the quality of the meals provided. The National Schools Dietary Services Limited, NSDSL, has adopted a number of measures early in this fiscal period to improve the efficiency of the school nutrition program to ensure that both the quality and the number of meals required by schools are maintained. These measures include, one, a reduction of wastage by ensuring that adjustments to the number of meals provided to schools are made in a timely manner, thereby ensuring that supply matches the number of meals required. Wastage in some schools was as high as 40%. Two, working with schools to reduce meals on days when it is anticipated that student attendance will be low. For example, during the week of Carnival, attendance drops to less than 50% and will also drop in May and June when Forms 5 and 6 students are writing CSEC and the CAPE examinations. Students doing these exams only attend school on the days that they have their examinations. Three, reduction of spending on all line items. In terms of the quantity of meals, in terms of the quality of meals, standards have been set and are being monitored by NSDSL to ensure that each meal, whether breakfast or lunch, meets the, the prescribed recommendation quality and dietary allowance. Madam President, the move, the above measures by the National School Dietary Services are therefore expected to offset the projected reduction of $15 million in 2016 and facilitate the provision of quality meals, approximately 59,000 breakfasts and 91,000 lunches to deserving children on a daily basis in over 800 schools throughout Trinidad. Thank you. Senator Mean. Uh, follow up. Um, uh, can the minister indicate to us uh, which are some of the schools that had some of this wastage? And you speak of the um, 40 up to 40 percent wastage. Minister of Education. Madam President, at this time, I'm sure everyone will be aware that it's most difficult to name those schools right now. Perhaps if the, honor the Honorable Center wants, we can supply a list of those schools subsequently. Is it that he is Senator Mean. Yeah, yes, Madam uh, President, I would like if you could provide the information. Um, hmm? Public business, government business, bill second reading. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, the matter before the House today is an act to vary the appropriation of the sum, the issue of which was authorized by the Appropriation Financial Year 2016 Act 2015. And Madam President, the bill has five clauses and a schedule. The essential matters are contained in the schedule. And if one goes to the schedule, one will see that certain heads of expenditure have been increased and certain heads of expenditure have been reduced. And if I can just quickly go through the Allocation to the Parliament has been increased by $16 million to provide for the continuation of funding of constituency offices for the payment of salaries to staff at these offices and also for repairs 
and uh, other expenses associated with the 41 constituency offices. That is head 05. Head 13, the sum of $122,661,129 has been transferred to the Office of the Prime Minister, ostensibly from the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services. And this is to make provision for the realignment of portfolios folios, whereby the responsibility for child services and gender affairs was moved from the Ministry of Social Development to the Office of the Prime Minister. National security has been increased by a small amount of $40,000 to deal with an obligation to an organization. The Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprise Development has been increased by $374 million, and that is to cater for the transfer of the on-the-job training program from the Ministry of Education to the Ministry of Labor. The Ministry of Community Development, uh, Culture and the Arts has been increased by $7.5 million as a result of additional responsibilities. The Ministry of Planning and Development has been increased by 39 million and that is essentially the transfer of the portfolio responsibility for the Institute of Marine Affairs to the Ministry, from the Ministry of Education to the Ministry of Planning and Development. As a result, the Ministry of Education has been reduced by $413,233,000, which is to account for the fact that they are no longer responsible for the on-the-job training program or the Institute of Marine Affairs. Ministry of Health has been reduced by six million because the responsibility for HIV AIDS has now been shifted to the Office of the Prime Minister, which is catered for in the $122 million that is being increased in the OPM's allocation. The Ministry of Housing Development has been reduced by 16 million because there was double counting with respect to a loan payment which has provided the allocation to be transferred to the parliament so there's a straight transfer of 16 million from housing to the parliament to cater for the increased cost of running constituency offices uh, sport and youth affairs has been reduced again because there's certain uh, matters that were handled by sport, which are now the responsibility of the Office of the Prime Minister. And social and family development, family services, has been reduced by 114 because, as I said, gender affairs and child services have moved to the Office of the Prime Minister. Now, Madam President, all of these are routine. It is simply portfolio realignments that took place in either September or December of 2015, based on various Gazette publications. Uh, the only one that is not routine is the Office of the Parliament, where it has, it has become necessary to supplement the Parliament's appropriation by 16 million to allow for the maintenance of the staff and the facilities at constituency offices to the end of fiscal 2016. However, having said all of that, as I indicated in the other place, it's all very well to speak about the movement of expenditure, but to speak about the movement of expenditure without looking at the revenue situation would mean that I would be speaking in a vacuum and that members opposite would not understand the situation that we are in. Because as for example, we are transferring the entire original allocation of $374 million for the on-the-job training program from education to labor, but we may not spend the entire $374 million by the end of the year. In fact, all of these amounts are simply a movement of the original appropriation. Now, what we have done this year, which is typical, what most governments have done in the past, I dare say, all of them, is that rather than rebudget, for example, when the former government was faced with um, the beginning of the slide in oil prices and the former Prime Minister had indicated 
that they needed to cut expenditure by about seven billion dollars. There was no rebudget. There was no new budget. There was simply an announcement that this would take place, and it is then managed by the Ministry of Finance in terms of conserving expenditure. So we're not doing a re-budget per se. We're simply today looking at the transfer of the original amounts, but it is a fact that there will be a reduction in expenditure so that all of these amounts may not be fully consumed by the end of the fiscal year. And what we have done, Madam President, to deal with that situation is we have managed to curtail expenditure, we plan to curtail expenditure by approximately $4 billion in this fiscal year. So that our original target for expenditure in fiscal 2016 was $63 billion. We are now targeting $59 billion. And if you do the maths, that is approximately 7% of the original budgetary allocation, the reduction. $4 billion is a little less than 7% of the original budgetary allocation of um, $63 billion. And Madam Speaker, while having cut expenditure to $59 billion, we also faced with a revenue shortfall. Uh, for the first six months of the year so far, we've been faced with a revenue shortfall of approximately $3 billion. And we predict that, that by the end of the year, we'll be facing a revenue shortfall of somewhere in the vicinity of six to seven billion dollars. So that, coupled with the uh, reduction in expenditure from 63 to 59 billion, we're going to have to increase our planned borrowing or our planned funding from the Heritage Fund for this year, 2016. And let me explain how this works. There's a concept called above the line and below the line. It's a difficult concept to grasp in accounting terms, but current revenue, which is tax revenue, is placed above the line in the accounting uh, sheet, and borrowing is placed below the line. The money in the Heritage and Stabilization Fund, which is revenue that has already been earned, would be placed below the line and therefore what we can do is replace borrowing with funding from the Heritage and Stabilization Fund. So let's say, for example, if we were to utilize 500 million US dollars of the Heritage and Stabilization Fund in this fiscal year to deal with the gap between current revenue and total expenditure, that would replace $3 billion more or less in borrowing. So you wouldn't have to borrow that money, we'd simply access it from the Heritage and Stabilization Fund. Alternatively, we can borrow the money. So there are options available to the government. But at the end of the day, after all of the taxation measures that were announced, or well, the revenue, let's call it revenue collection measures, that were announced in the October 2015 budget, and the revenue collection measures announced last week in the other place, we are still facing a $15 billion gap between current revenue and total expenditure. So we're looking at current revenue somewhere in the vicinity of about $44 billion and total expenditure of $59 billion. And we will finance this gap, this $15 billion gap, as I said, by a combination of borrowing and possibly drawdowns from the Heritage Fund. We'll just have to monitor that as we go along and see whether we can manage by way of borrowing or whether we need to access some money from the Heritage Fund. And capital receipts, which we've already received some money from Trinidad Generation Unlimited, TGU. Uh, we've already received in this fiscal year approximately 300 million US dollars. And um, we expect to get another 250 million US dollars, more or less, from TGU. Uh, we have already accessed um, 1.5 billion from the Phoenix Park IPO, and we also expect to get some funding from the disposal of assets now belonging to Colonial Life, which uh, are being used to recover some of the money that um, 
was paid by the government to deal with the CLECO bailout. Uh, that quantum is now estimated to be in excess of $20 billion. I am hopeful that within the next month or two, I will have a very accurate figure. But at this time, I am satisfied that the amount is somewhere in the vicinity of 20 plus billion dollars. So far, seven billion has been recovered by way of the sale of the first set of methanol shares. And I might say something about that. There, there was an error made <coughs> in the past by the former administration when they violated the shareholders agreement with respect to the sale of those particular methanol shares and they attempted to sell those shares to a third party. But the shareholders agreement requires in this particular case that if you're going to dispose of your shares, you first have to offer them to the other shareholder. So the other shareholder took the matter to arbitration uh, the government contested the arbitration and lost. This is mm -hmm. the former government. And as a result, the government was ordered to sell its shares to the other shareholder in um, the methanol company, companies, the methanol group. And the outcome of that error was a loss in capital value of somewhere around $2 billion because the shares had been valued at $9 billion, but the country only received seven billion because the because of the mistake made in attempting to sell the shares to a third party the arbitrator not only ordered the government to sell them to the other shareholder but also valued the shares so that whereas the shares had been valued previously at nine billion the other party was able to convince the um, arbitrator that the shares should be sold at seven billion they should be undervalued because there was a problem with the availability of the supply of natural gas. So because there was curtailment in the supply of natural mm -hmm. gas, the other party was able to convince the arbitrator that the shares should be reduced in value, and the arbitrator so ordered. So we got $7 billion for those shares. Now, if it had been done in the proper manner, there would not have been this um, forced uh, sale of those shares, and we might well have got 8 or $9 billion out of it because and there would have been no arbitrator and no confrontational adversarial approach by the other shareholder to this matter. But be that as it may, that has happened. So we got seven billion instead of nine, but that is history. And now we are moving on to see whether we can recover other monies from the assets held by Clico. Clico has, another, has shares in another methanol company located in Oman. And these shares are valued at somewhere in the vicinity of $2 billion. There are some difference of opinion on what the value is. But again, my advice is that that is a similar situation where you have to offer the shares to the other shareholder, the third party, at uh, the market valuation. You have to commission a valuation and then offer the shares to the third party at the market valuation. And they have a 30 days to accept or reject, and then you can go out on the market and see if you can get a better price from another person. But we, we are in the process of resolving this issue, the disposal of the second set of methanol shares owned by Colonial Life, which we expect will bring us at least $2 billion. Then you have the sale of the traditional portfolio of Colonial Life, which has been offered to um, a number of insurance companies and other entities. I believe uh, at least 17 of them registered locally in Trinidad and Tobago. And then there are other assets associated with colonial life, so we expect to realize another billion out of that. So this is how we're going to close that $15 billion gap. We, we, we have already received some revenue from asset sales and one-off extraordinary items of income. And then we are conti continuing with the orderly disposal of some, some of the assets owned by Colonial Life in accordance with a procedure that has been established by the central bank, which is the uh, entity that took over the insurance company under Section 44 of the Insurance Act when uh, the central bank uh, took control of Colonial Life. And, it, and there is now a plan 
to deal with the um, resolution of that matter. So that is how we are for this year. Uh, current revenue of 44 billion, and we'll have to make up the shortfall of 15 billion using a combination of capital revenue and borrowings and or um, some money out of the Heritage and Stabilization Fund. Next year, there are still assets and, of, and we'll also be receiving dividends from the National Gas Company. Dividends are considerably reduced in the past with um, reasonably high gas prices in foreign markets such as Japan and other areas in the Far East, in Europe, in Central and South America, the National Gas Company was able to realize prices for its cargoes in excess of $10 per MMBTU. In, in, at, some, at some times, the prices were as high as $20 per MMBTU. But because gas prices, natural gas prices, follow oil prices, there's a delay but they, they follow them because it's a hydrocarbon, it's a fossil fuel, so it's just an alternative form of energy. Mm -hmm. People have a choice between using fuel oil, diesel, and natural gas. They have options available to them. Power producers and other people who use fossil fuels, they have options. So as the price of oil drops, uh, consumers can exercise their option to switch between natural gas as their fuel, and oil or uh, other uh, petroleum products. So that what you find is that there isn't an immediate fall off in the price of natural gas, but eventually the, the price of natural gas begins to drop in the same way that oil has dropped. And I am advised that whereas in the past in Central America and other places we were getting $12, $11, MMBTU for our natural gas, we're now down to $6 and $5 and so on. So that the income from natural gas is considerably reduced. And as a result, the income received by the national gas company is considerably reduced. Whereas in the good times, NGC might earn five, six billion dollars a year in profits. The profits for this year, I'm told, will be less than three billion dollars. So whereas in the past, governments were able to take five or six billion dollars per year. Well, not governments, the, the former government. I, I, I don't think any government before that did anything like that. In fact, it's not a question of thinking. I know that in the past, the dividends taken from the National Gas Company were of the order of one billion dollars, sometimes 1.5 billion dollars in extreme cases. But the former government established a precedent whereby they took five and six billion dollars a year out of NGC. And they could do it because that was somewhere in the vicinity of the profits that NGC was making. Even though it wasn't prudent to do it, they had the ability to do it, so they seized the ability and took the money. In fact, they took about 13 or 14 billion dollars out of NGC over a three or four year period. But the country can no longer do this because NGC is no longer earning that amount of money and that NGC's cash reserves are severely depleted, uh, having lost 13 or 14 billion dollars of reserves over the last five years. But we still can get some dividends from the NGC, and we expect that next year, again, we will be able to get some dividends from the NGC. We will be able to continue to get some um, income from the disposal of the assets of colonial life. But after next year, one would assume that our revenue will be in the 45, 46 billion dollar range because a lot of the fiscal measures will begin to kick in next year rather than this year because there, there's a, a delay between the commencement of a revenue collection measure and the actual result, the actual income. We expect by next year uh, our revenue, our enhanced revenue collection measures will start to kick in and we may get 46 billion dollars in revenue next year despite the fact that oil may remain at 40 or 45 dollars. But after that, that is 2017 I'm talking about, after that, in 2018, unless 
we either reduce the national expenditure or we manage to find other revenue streams, there is going to be a problem in this country. And people need to understand that. That is that either we reduce the national expenditure or we increase revenue somehow. And people need to understand the size. What I've realized is that it's a kind of a, people are kind of shell-shocked. And this is not just in the private sector, it's in the public sector as well. They're not accustomed to this sort of thing. They're not accustomed to a situation where your expenditure is 15 to 20 billion dollars more than your revenue. They're just not accustomed to it. In fact, I remember in 2007 or 8, when gas was $13 a MMBTU Henry Hub. Not, not, we're not talking yeah. Japan now. We're talking about North America. Henry Hub, $13 a MMBTU. I remember in that particular year, it was either 2007 or 2006 or 8, it's in that era, that the government had a, a surplus. You know, we, we've had, for, since 2009, we've had deficits. But believe it or not, there was a $12 billion surplus, $12 billion surplus in, in, in that particular year. And that was because of the, the, the astronomical prices being um, earned for natural gas in particular. So when you had a Henry Hub price of $13, I mean, the country was making billions and billions of dollars from the Atlantic LNG plant from the petrochemical companies because petrochemical products, their prices follow the price of natural gas. And the profits, the way the, the, these things are done, the profits that are derived or that accrue to the government, the money that accrues to the government is based on the price of the end product. So as the end price of the end product of methanol, urea, ammonia goes up, the price of natural gas goes up. That is the, the, the price that they pay for natural gas from Trinidad and Tobago, and the income to the country goes up. So you had a situation where petrochemical prices were very high, natural gas price very high, oil price very high, in, in those days it was $145. So we had a situation where we actually had a huge budget surplus. We couldn't spend the money. In fact, the economy was overheating. That was one of the complaints back in the 2007 period, that the, the, the government was spending too much. The economy was overheating. There was tremendous inflation. Inflation had crossed 10%. And that we just couldn't spend the amount of money available at the time. Now, it's the exact opposite. You, you move from a situation where you had a surplus of 12 billion now to an unfinanced gap of 15 billion dollars. But I, I, the population has not yet become accustomed to this. They're not accustomed to it. It's a shock. Even in the public service, the, the cash balances in the central bank only went into overdraft in 2013. For the first time ever in the history of Trinidad and Tobago, except perhaps way back in 1972 or something like that, just before you had the, um, the Yom Kippur War in 1973, and then the price of oil just skyrocketed in 1973. But back in 71, I haven't gone that far back. There may have been a situation where the cash balances were in overdraft. But in the modern era, the cash balances only went into overdraft in 2013. So you had a situation where public servants would be releasing funds assuming that the full overdraft of $9 billion was available. Because the way the overdraft is organized, it is used to make temporary advances in, in months where you may not expect to get a lot of revenue. So, you, so a lot of the companies give you your major income in taxation at the end of each quarter. So you get money in March, you get it in June, you get it in September, you get it in December. But you have months in between uh, like April, May, uh, August, and so on. These are lean months where you're not getting the kind of revenue that you would get at the end of the quarter. And the purpose of the government overdraft was to deal with those months where you don't have the cash flow. So you take a temporary advance from the central bank, and then you retire that advance, you repay it, and you bring your overdraft back to, to zero. In fact, until 2013, the overdraft was billions of dollars in credit. My memory tells me that in 2010, it was in a, we had $6 billion in credit in terms of the cash balances at the central bank. And, and it was more than that previously. 
in, you know, in 2009, 2008, and so on. It was even higher than that. It might have been $11 billion, $12 billion in credit in the central bank. So we now move to a situation where I have to get a daily report on the cash balances every single day. That's where we, we reached. For the whole of 2015, I'm told from January, we were running with the overdraft right up close to the $9 billion limit, running just over $8 billion in overdraft. And let me explain this overdraft. It's a statutory provision where, by law, the government is allowed to access 15% of the total revenue, this is both current and capital revenue, for the year. So the total revenue, excluding borrowing, for this year was estimated at 60 billion initially. And therefore, you take the 15% multiplied by the 6 billion, you get an overdraft facility available to the government of 9 billion. And that was also available to the government in 2015 because the revenue again was estimated to be in that area, 60 billion. But for the whole of 2015, from January coming up, the overdraft was up in the 7 billion, 8 billion dollar situation, coming right down to September when you had the change of government. And the, the, the public servants are not yet accustomed. I think they're accustomed now. I was told in the last three months, they're now beginning to check it as well on a daily basis. So they would release funds based on the appropriation. So you have an appropriation of 63 billion, and each ministry and department would get an allocation on this particular head. Let's use the OJT one that we're looking at today of 374 million. So that in the past, the public servants would just release funds in accordance with the appropriation. They wouldn't look at the cash balance. But now they have to, every single day. In fact, I had a discussion last night with um, my, my officers in the ministry about a particular allocation uh, that of a very large sum of about $600 million that we now have to do it in, in, in tranches. Whereas in the past, you would just allocate $600 million. That is, this is to Tobago, by the way. Whereas in the past, you, Tobago usually gets its money on a quarterly basis, and they would get about six, seven hundred million dollars a quarter. You now have to give them on a monthly basis is as bad as that, because the cash, the cash balance is right up on the limit. And, I, and in fact, I had to tell my officer, just call them and explain to them what's going on, because the whole country still has to get sensitized to what's happening in Trinidad and Tobago. And it is because of things like this that we have to look at ways and means of raising revenue. And this is why, or saving money. Is it you raise revenue or you save money? And this is why we have, we have chosen to look at removing the fuel subsidy. Now the fuel subsidy for this year at the original budget estimate for oil of $45 with some arrears coming forward from last year was somewhere in the vicinity of $1.7 billion. <coughs> Now, that's down from a high of $6 billion in the good times. When oil was $100, $110, the, the subsidy on fuel was $6 billion. I think it's necessary to explain how the subsidy works. What happens is we import expensive oil from other countries because our refinery is, is designed to refine about 150,000 barrels, Mr. Senator Khan. But we only produce about 70, 72,000 barrels of oil in Trinidad and Tobago. So in order to make up the other 70,000, we import oil. So Trinidad and Tobago imports expensive oil, refines it in an expensive refinery, which itself has cost this country a lot of money over the last 10, 15 years to upgrade, and then sells it at a loss to the consumer. That's how the fuel subsidy works. So you, you import expensive oil. You you, you expense yourself refining it, and then you sell it back to uh, the Trinidad and Tobago population at a loss. <coughs> that is what we've been doing. Now, it, has, it is a decision made by all previous governments that this is, a, this is how you can deal with surplus revenues. Because in order to do that, you have to have surplus revenues. You can only subsidize something if you have money to get from somewhere to subsidize it. But we're now in a situation where we just don't have. We have a $15 billion gap instead of a $12 billion surplus. So that 
we have taken a decision that we need to start phasing out the fuel subsidy. Otherwise, the money that we spend on the fuel subsidy, we'll have to take that money from somewhere else. So you'll have to take it from health, you'll have to take it from education, and spend it on the fuel subsidy. So these are choices that we as a, we as a country we need to make. We need to understand them. It's very easy to talk about the increase in price of fuel. You, know. you could make noise about that. I'm talking about honorable members on the front bench now. But I would like honorable members on the front bench to tell me, well, what would you do? If you were faced with a $15 billion gap between revenue and expenditure, what would you do? What would you cut? Would you cut education? Would you cut health? Well, we cut that. And would you increase electricity rates? Would you increase water rates? Would you close down URP? Would you stop CPEP? Would you eliminate GATE? Because these are all the options available to the country. We have, we're missing $15 billion. What are we going to do? We're going to borrow the whole 15? We could do that. And then send our, our debt service ratio sky high, affect our credit rating, increase the interest rate at which the government has to borrow, maybe even reduce um, our credit rating to junk bond status. We could do that. You know, it's, other countries do that, you know. There are countries in the world that have decided, all right, the way they will deal with a financing gap is they go borrow and send their debt to GDP ratio somewhere up to 150 percent. I mean, there are islands in the Caribbean like this, you know, that have, Jamaica is a case in point, they have their debt, St. Kitts and so on, Grenada, their debt to GDP ratio is upwards of 100 percent. We could do that. And then, as I said, it, it will, it will send our credit rating down to junk bond status and then when we go to borrow, instead of paying 4% and 5% and 3%, which is what the government pays now to access loan financing, we'll be paying 13% and 15% and so on. We could do that. That is what Greece did. Greece did that. And then look what happened to Greece. So that's an option available to us which this government will not exercise. We will not exercise that that option and engage in um, indiscriminate borrowing. We'll be very prudent with our, our, our debt management. We could let electricity rates rise to an unsubsidized level. We could do that. And electricity rates will probably double, I would think. I think electricity rates in Trinidad and Tobago are the lowest in the Caribbean. That's my understanding. Because they're heavily subsidized. One of the transfers and subsidies that the country makes, mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I want to emphasize that the country, because our budget comes here, everything is in front of you, and transfers and subsidies total 50% of the national budget. I don't think people understand that. So you're talking about the expenditure on CPEP, GATE, URP, transfers to TNTEC, transfers to WASA, all of these things cost this country somewhere in the vicinity of 25 to 30 billion dollars a year. 50% of the national, um, the fuel subsidy and so on. 50% of national expenditure is on transfers and subsidies. So that, again, we could, we could take a decision, all right? We'll stop all of that. No more transfers, no more subsidies. Stop GATE, stop URP, stop CPEP. Let electricity go to where it should be. Let water go to where it should be. Let the, the bus fares and PTSE go up to the economic level, let the rates on the fast ferry to Tobago go to the economic level. Uh, but we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that because, if, you know, a government has to make decisions on how it utilizes its income for the public good. So that is why when you're managing a very difficult situation like this, you have to have a mixture of, of difficult economic measures and fiscal prudence in terms of borrowing, in terms of how you target your expenditure and so on. And this is why we have decided that it is better to reduce the fuel subsidy and take the money from that saving and use it to target things as such as bus transportation, putting more buses on the road, reducing taxes on um, public transport vehicles like maxi taxis and taxis, which, was, which is going to be a loss of income, but we, we could take the money saved from the fuel subsidy and subsidize the cost of, of public transport vehicles and put more buses on the road and continue to 
ensure that bus fares are kept at a very low level and an economic level. These are decisions that, that is, we as a country have to make. And this is a decision which this government is taking, that it is better to take the money that is applied to the fuel subsidy and apply it towards public transportation. And, and there's another argument for that, in that when you look at who really benefits from the fuel subsidy, it is the upper, upper income groups. There have been numerous studies on this, numerous. And the figures that um, I have seen is that upper income families uh, benefit in excess of $2,000 a month from the fuel subsidy because they have bigger cars, they have more cars, they, they, they consume more fuel, they drive more. And lower income families may, con may benefit maybe five to $700 a month. However, that five to $700 a month is a much larger percentage of the low income group than, it, than the 2000 or $2,500 is of the upper income group. But why should we subsidize upper income families to the tune of $2,500 a month when people at the low level are only getting a subsidy of $500? So it's better to take that $2,500 and apply it to the people at the lower level by putting more buses on the road, reducing the cost of public transportation vehicles and so on. And I heard a senator speak there about rapid rail. We made a commitment during the general election campaign that we would examine the proposed mass transit solution with the assistance of the Inter-American Development Bank using technical advice and technical support and experts supplied by the Inter-American Development Bank because they have expertise in this area. They came into the country very soon after the general election in October, November. They met with the government and they conducted a number of studies and they presented us with a report just at the end of February and they have advised us that in the current economic climate the project is just too expensive. It's a nice thing. It's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to provide fast, efficient, comfortable railway transportation to your population. It's a wonderful thing. And we'd love to do it. You know, if the price of oil was $100 or $150, of course we could do it. Because the surplus in um, 2007, in that one year alone, would have paid for the, for the railway system. So you could have taken all the surplus in that year and and done a railway project. But in the current economic climate, it's just too expensive, and we just decided that we have, to, we have to defer this project at this point in time. We can't do it. It doesn't make any sense. We don't have the money. And therefore, what do you do? Because if you're going to no longer pursue the railway option, what is the alternative? So you have to now use the roads to solve the problem. So you have to put more buses on the roads. You have to expand the, the road network. You have to increase the capacity of the road network. You have to remove the bottlenecks, which is remove, try, well not try, remove the signalized intersections, remove traffic lights, increase roadways to three lanes. For example, the South Highway is three lanes down to, I never get, it's not Shokonas, it's before the Diwalinaga. I never get that, I never get that, um, that, that location correct, it's where they, the, the curry um, manufacturers are along the highway. Charlieville. Charlieville, thank you very much. I know it's where the COP has their, their <laughs> origin center. And you know they actually have the word Charlieville below it. But I never get that location right. It's be, before the Diwali Nagar, where you have three lanes coming down, and then you go into two. And then you have two lanes all the way down to San Fernando. And similarly, when you're coming from San Fernando, it's two lanes until you hit Charlieville. So obviously, a solution for the north-south um, route will be to continue the three lanes, both sides, all the way to San Fernando. That is, Minister, that would, you have five more minutes. Thank you very much. I'm almost finished. That would um, increase the road capacity. And then we're going to invite tenders for the Curep interchange. We're going to... Con no, it's all right. There was no need for that. We're going to continue with the construction of interchanges all the way up the east-west corridor at um, Trin City, at Piaco, at McCoy, and so on. And then we're going to focus on bypass roads in the Shogwanas area, for example, very congested area, in Tobago around Scarborough, very congested, and so on. Sangri Grandi, we have a bypass road uh, for the, I, I can't give you all the locations, but the, the thing now is to expand the road network and to put more buses on the road. 
And finally, um, Madam President, one of the other measures that we have decided to implement is uh, tax on online purchases from online retail stores. And I deliberately announced it in April and announced an implementation date in September because this is a very complex issue. So we have given ourselves five months to resolve all of the issues, like how would you collect the tax? There are many different ways. If, for example, you looked at your airline ticket, you would see that there is a tax on airline tickets, but most people don't see that. The tax is collected by the airlines and remitted to the government. So there are ways of doing it, let the banks collect it, let the credit card companies collect it and remit it to the government. We have to look at exemptions like medical supplies. We have to look at a, a, a threshold and so on for this tax. So we've given ourselves five months to work this thing out. And um, we also felt that if we're going to promote renewable energy, we should kickstart the shift in the population's thinking by exempting vehicles using alternative energy sources from all taxes, not just custom duty, not just VAT, not just motor vehicle tax, but all of them. So CNG vehicles, hybrid vehicles, electric vehicles will now be exempt from all taxes. And this is to promote a shift away from vehicles running on fossil fuels towards vehicles running on alternative energy. And we're going to push very hard into the renewable energy um, system to try and move our population towards using solar energy, towards using wind energy and so on. And we also felt that to spread the burden of, of adjustment across the board, that it was necessary to impose high taxes on what we call luxury vehicles, which are vehicles exceeding a cubic capacity of 1999 cc. And let me say that there are other types of luxury vehicles, like vehicles that are turbocharged, that may have a cubic capacity of 1999 cc's. And we, we decided not to deal with that now because we needed to work out an appropriate horsepower in terms of a turbocharged vehicle. But that is coming too. I want to let my honorable members know. I see a senator laughing because I know that I know Trinidadians are very clever. So that when they saw the 1999 CCs, they said, all right, I'll get a turbocharged car at 1.8. So, I love it too. madam, yes, I am. <laughs> well, guess again. So that will come in the next budget. So, Madam President, I trust I've explained the government's approach to dealing with our financial challenges. And as I said, the, the matters in the bill are very routine and very normal transfers of, of funding dealing with a realignment of portfolios. I beg to move. Honorable Senators, I shall now propose the question for debate. The question is that a bill entitled The question is that a bill entitled an act to vary the appropriation of the sum, the issue of which was authorized by the Appropriation Financial Year 2016 Act 2015 be now read a second time. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Madam President, no one can argue that Trinidad and Tobago is in a very difficult place and that we require to take certain measures and certain actions in an effort to stabilize, renew, revive, and to take the economy forward. I will deal with what I consider to be some distortions issued from the lips of the minister a little later on in my presentation. But what I want to say from the outset is that maybe the minister required a little more time as he had it in the other place to give us a perspective. But what he offered here this morning lacked vision, lacks direction, and there's an absence of an economic strategy 
Madam President, in this presentation as it relates to how are we going to take Trinidad and Tobago through some well-defined roadmap to address these various challenges in the short, medium, and long term. Of course, the minister in his opening talked about the matter of the variation of appropriation and said that he required a little more discussion to tell us, to inform us that without revenues, these expenditures are not going to mean anything to anybody. And while he did provide us with some revenue raising measures late in the presentation, we didn't get from the Honorable Minister a sense of the revenues that would be derived from the various, from the various measures announced. For example, the subsidy reduction of some 15% on both super and diesel. We didn't get a sense from the minister exactly what amount of revenues would be realized by the government as a result of this particular measure and how this ties in to this transfer of six, almost $600 million. But I want to advise you, Madam President, that it was Thomas Jefferson, I think he was the third president of the United States, who said that the care of human life and happiness and not their destruction is the first and only object of good government. The reality is that this government, after six months, going into seven, seemed to have set the stage to destroy the lives of ordinary people in this country by the measures that they have taken in the last seven months. You know, under the Kamala Prasad administration, the Cessa administration, that is. It is said by some of the ordinary people that they went with a pocket full of money to the grocery and brought and bought a basket full of goods. But today, the very people are telling us that they have to go literally to the grocery with a basket full of money, and they are taking home a pocket full of goods. This is what has happened under this administration. Rising food prices, Madam President, brought about by insensitive increases in fuel costs, represent a destructive measure of the care for human life and happiness. The minister in his presentation failed to assimilate or failed to provide a vision or details of meaningful policy measures, Madam President, aimed at boosting business investment demand in order to increase consumer spending and to jumpstart the economy of this country. What we have been experiencing is more increases in taxes during an economic downturn 
and which is going to contribute to an overall reduction in aggregate demand, and which we believe is going to worsen the economic scenario. I didn't say so. You just only have to read the Central Bank latest economic bulletin. And they have forecasted where this economy is heading under this administration. It is as if Crapo smoke the poor people's pipe in this country, given this administration's approach to development. Madam President, what we are conscious of is that over the last six months, six months rather, this administration has done little, little to promote employment. More jobs have been lost in this country, Madam President, than have been created by this administration. Productivity has been reduced. Inflation has increased. Headline inflation in particular, according to the Central Bank, now stands at 9.4%, Madam President. Ten, over 10,000 workers have lost their jobs, according to rough estimates issued in this country. And in fact, I think it was Professor Carl Theodore who predicted that we could end up with close to 15% unemployment during this recessionary period, Madam President. So what do we have, Madam President, to stimulate the economy of TNT, given our current circumstances? What we have is a slew of regressive measures that have been imposed on the people by this regime that is going to result in people being able to purchase less and the government being able to collect less in terms of VAT as an example. In fact, the minister in a publication in a newspaper indicated that there's already a major shortfall in VAT collections in this country. I think he said amounted to some $3 billion thus far. So Madam President, the economy of this country under this administration is heading for major contraction. The central bank is predicting that we could expect a 2% contraction in this economy at the end of 2016, if, more, if not more. The reserves of our country, which started at 10.3 in September, when the government of the PNM took office, now stands at about 9.3. So over a billion dollars, more or less, close to a billion, have disappeared in that period under this administration. Yet silly ministers said everything is stable. It's almost the same amount that they inherited. You did not inherit 9.3 billion. You inherited 10.3 billion US dollars. So where the next billion gone, Madam President? He needs to explain to the country what has happened to this one billion dollars. And the minister, when he came with his um, various, Madam President, revenue raising measures in terms of borrowing, he did indicate that he would be comfortable and the country would be comfortable with a debt to GDP of over 65%. That is on the, on the Hansard record. No, 65%. You said 65%, Madam President. No, 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 the Central Bank is saying that under his stewardship, we could be close to 60% of debt to GDP by the end of 2016. And more. Uh, 
and and maybe beyond. Madam President, this government, this government should be looking at. We talk about expenditure reduction. When we were there, Madam President, we went from 63 to 59. They came to power. They went to 63 billion, and now they have reduced to 59, Madam President. And that is why they have that gap. They have to go further and shave, Madam President, if they want to ensure that we don't end up into the hands of the International Monetary Fund that they are so concerned about us heading, Madam President. I want to ask the Honorable Minister of Finance, Madam President, with this reduct increase in super gasoline, I want you to tell this country, because you were very vociferous in 2012, when the then PP administration increased premium from $4 to 5.75 per liter, and he accused the government of um, breaking the law. And then later on, he went to say, he went on to say that market price should be lower because the price of oil was lower, and people were being robbed at the pump. He didn't say that, Madam President. I want him to explain to this country why the why the price of super gasoline at a price of $40 US per barrel of oil Isn't lower. is being sold at $3.61. It is. $3.58, Madam President, I'm corrected. Why are you charging people $3.58 at the pump when you yourself admitted that at a price of $45 a barrel, unsubsidized, a, the, 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 a litre of super gasoline should be 361. The price of a barrel of oil is $40 traded. Yet still, you are charging people at the pump $3.58 per litre. Why are you robbing the people at the pump? You must explain to the country why you are charging people that price. And Madam President, not only that, Madam President, premium, premium gas is now 575 per litre. Madam President, you know what is going on right now? At $40 per barrel of oil, we have calculated 41 whatever. Madam President, at, at the price of $40, $41 at the pump, why are we charging 575, Madam President, when it ought to be at least about three, about 375. So you are robbing people almost two dollars at the pump. I want to get some clarification, Madam President, on this matter. Why is the Minister of Finance charging the ordinary people who use premium gasoline? At, at well, rich people, poor people, middle class people. Why are you charging rich people, middle class people, five seventy five when it's supposed to be three seventy five? Two dollars difference. I want the minister to explain that to the country. Why? Because you were the big advocate, talking about illegality, talking about people charging more than they ought to pay. Now you are in charge and you are doing the very sad thing that you accused the previous administration of doing. What hypocrisy we have in the Minister of Finance, Madam President. And, and, and Madam President, I'll talk about this matter about the rich benefiting more than the poor on this fuel subsidy, using his own examples to debunk the argument that he has been advancing to this country. But Madam President, before I go there, I want to let you know that this so-called media review, Madam President, 
really shows up the minister and his failures. On the one hand, what is being presented to us is that the 2016 budget presented one set of realities or one gave one, set, one picture and the economic reality revealed something else. So that is why he has come back here in, in the month of April to do what he calls a review of what he did. But, you know, for six months, he held no consultations with the trade unions. No consultations with the trade union. No discussions with stakeholders. But he promised, Madam President, that he would hold consultations before the midterm review. But Saitong, Jetong, and Natuk, representing the organized working people of this country, had no inputs into the midterm review or the mid-year review. Why? Why even consult with these organizations to the point that they have to call for a deferral and then you dismiss them and say, well, look, later for you. We can't defer anything now. We have to move to increase the price of fuel quickly. And we don't want to discuss that with you, Madam President. Madam President, we all have to acknowledge, even though they are afraid to see it, that the country is in a recession. And we are seeing all the signs of a recession. Falling demand, rising unemployment, Madam President. Social displacement, Madam President. Declining growth. But to help us navigate these turbulent times, the country needs experienced, competent, and capable government. Not what we have here today. A group of incompetent people that are consistently mismanaging the resources of our country. That is what we have here today. Madam President, this is what is required. Experienced, competent, and capable individual. But this government, as you know, is lacking in that department. Madam President, what is clear is that we must acknowledge that there are challenging times facing Trinidad and Tobago today. The minister seems to be very short term in his focus. But in these times, Madam President, the country wants the government to come up with a long-term, medium-term plan, a roadmap to take us forward, to give us comfort, to give us confidence. Business confidence is very low in the country. Um, consumer confidence is also low in this country. I want to remind you, Madam President, that a budget is not an exercise in arithmetic. It is not only juggling the numbers and just seeking to balance the books. It is more than juggling with the numbers, Madam President. The role of the government, of any government, Mr. Ma Madam President, is to facilitate economic development. It is to promote a healthy and safe environment. Madam President, it is to deliver effectively and efficiently public goods and services. The budget that we are reviewing is a tool of the government expressed as a plan which tells the nation how they are going to achieve objectives, Madam President. What are the objectives, Madam President, behind these various measures that the minister announced to the country and to this parliament recently? Is it merely to balance revenue with expenditure, Madam President? Is that the objective? Or is there some other meaningful and relevant objectives, Madam President, such as economic growth, full employment or moving towards full employment, a safe environment, 
a higher standard of living, a reduction or lowering in the cost of living. These certainly, Madam President, cannot be the objectives of the Minister of Finance because we are seeing all of these things in reverse gear in Trinidad and Tobago today. Why the people are asking, is the Minister of Finance punishing the poor? Why is the Minister of Finance punishing and attacking the vulnerable in this country? Why is the Minister of Finance, Madam President, seeking to come to this parliament to give the impression that he is seeking to bring about an equitable adjustment of the process given the crisis that we are faced with. But where is the evidence? Where is the manifestation, Madam President, of this development in our country? Where is the minister seeking to bring about an equitable adjustment in the burdens, Madam President? What we are seeing is that the economic measures being promoted by the government are designed to provide the rich with a safer haven. And the poor and the vulnerable, Madam President, are exposed more and more by this government. Madam President, I want to indicate that the Minister of Finance, for example, indicates that the rich benefit disproportionately from the fuel subsidy. The minister is quoted as saying that the average benefit of the subsidy to low-income households could be in the region of $500 per month, while the benefit to the upper-income household exceeds $2,000 per month. Madam President, assuming that the low income household averages at 5,000 per month in terms of income, and the income of the rich individual that he speaks about is about $40,000 a month, Madam President, with the removal of the fuel subsidy, the cost of the low-income household is 10% of his salary, Madam President, while the cost to the higher income winner is about 5%. So, 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 you know, sometimes you get the impression when the minister is speaking, he leaves out these very critical elements and goes on a frolic of his own in order to promote his own agenda to the country that the reason why he's removing the subsidy is because it benefits the rich more than the poor. Is that is what he's about, he's Madam President. Partners, that is what. Partners. So this is, is a very deceptive argument partners. that he and his colleagues and so on are promoting to give to the to, to give the impression, Madam President, friend. Yeah. That, that 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 the poor, you know, you know, do not really um, benefit. Um, from this whole exercise. I think somebody reminded them recently of Engels' law, that the poor spends more than 50% on his, on food. That's right. That's right. You don't know about Engels' law? Well, this is Engels' law at work again. Yes. Yeah, no right? No idea. So, so, so what this government under this administration has been doing since it came to power, they have been shifting the country from what is called a progressive system of taxation, which is more direct and more equitable. And they have introduced a more regressive, indirect system of taxation in this country, which is bleeding and brutalizing the poor, True. the vulnerable, True. and the working people True. of this country, Madam President. That is what they have been doing. They have, they, 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 they have allowed the minister is conscious of the fact, and he has indicated in this country that there is, there is a high degree of transfer mispricing in this country, 
where companies, multinationals in the energy sector set up shell companies all over the world and robbing this country of tens of billions of dollars every year. Why don't you go after them? You must go after the energy companies that are robbing this country tens of billions of dollars every year because of transfer mispricing. True. Why are you coming to tax me? Why are you coming to tax the poor? Go where the people are robbing the country. Go after the rich and the powerful. Madam President, I, I also understand that in terms of tax avoidance and tax evasion, Trinidad and Tobago may be losing close to $10 billion every year because of tax avoidance and tax evasion. Rather than the minister try to beef up the BIR, which is the Board of Inland Revenue, and the Customs and Excise Department, and the VAT offices, which I understand, Madam President, is half. They have half the complement of staff that they currently require. Half. If you want to deal with raising revenue, you beef up tax administration. True. Beef up tax administration. Restructure, reorganize BIR. You don't have to bring a revenue authority there. Restructure BIR. Bring the professionals on board and deal with these tax dodgers and tax evaders, Madam President, that are robbing our country. But you're coming at us. You're coming at the ordinary people who have no choice, who have no choice, because we are captives. We are easily captives, Madam President. So, so you have the multinational corporations, local conglomerates, part of it, I understand. Then you have corporations that are dodging us in terms of tax avoidance, tax evasion, transfer mispricing, amounting to tens of billions of dollars. Go and look for the revenue where you're supposed to find it. That is what you're supposed to do. But the, the Minister of Finance is not dealing with that. What he's doing is crucifying the poor. The poor. Yes. He's crucifying the poor and the vulnerable and the working people. Senator Mark. So, Madam President. Can you address your, address your remarks oh, to me? I, and could you just be a little more moderate in your language? Moderate in me? Yes. Oh, man, man. Ma Madam President, let me tell you something. No, no. Don't tell me. Senator Mark, you and I are not having a conversation. Please address me, and I am. Okay, okay. Sorry, yes. I apologize. Yes. No, I, I understand. Yes. I apologize. Madam President, I want to tell you. Your yeah. voice is yeah, now overpowering, yeah. Senator. Yeah. Madam President, I want to let you know that when I speak in this parliament, I Senator, speak. Um, have a seat. Senator Mean, do you have an issue with my asking Senator Mark something? Thank you. When I speak in this honorable parliament, this honorable senate, I speak on behalf of over 350,000 ordinary people and their families in this country. And Madam President, I want to tell you that people are angry. People are angry. People are frustrated. And I want to warn this government, if they continue to go along the path that they are going, pressurizing the poor, hurting the poor, robbing the poor, there will be social instability and upheaval in this country. Madam President, you cannot be taking advantage of poor people in the way that they have been doing it and expect to get away scot-free. You refuse to consult the trade unions on measures that you are introducing that will oppress their workers and then tell the workers and so on that give you a chance, you, can, you have no time, but you have, to, you have time to deal with your business colleagues. But you don't have time for the ordinary people. The people are hurting, Madam President. They are crying. They are crying blood in this country, Madam President. And when they meet me, they tell me about it. And they tell me when I come to this parliament, tell the Minister of Finance that he's taking advantage of them. He's punishing them. Go and look for the money where you're supposed to find it. I tell you, Madam President, that the minister is aware because he came here. I asked him questions. He came here and he gave a commitment that he, Madam President, 
is going to ensure that legislation is introduced in this parliament to deal with transfer mispricing. He said that is a reality in our country. Madam President, why is he taking so long to bring legislation to deal with transfer mispricing? Why is he taking so long? And why has he taken steps to beef up staff at BIR, VAT, that is the VAT offices, Madam President, and the Customs and Excise Department? You have to bring the staff complement up to a level, Madam President, to deal with the, the tax dodgers. So when you deal with the tax dodgers, you wouldn't bring the pressure on the poor and the ordinary vulnerable people as you are doing. Madam President, we have discerned a trend under this administration. They have a bias and they have a focus on consumption and they have a bias and a focus on labor. Labor and consumption seem to be their focus of attention for pressure in this country. I want the government to start thinking, Madam President, of, as I said, Madam President, capital gains. Madam President, there was an old act that the English brought called the Succession and Estate Duties Act, which dealt with inheritances, where people who inherit millions of dollars they will be able to make a contribution to national development. That is no longer in existence. Why the government does not deal with that? Deal with some kind of inheritance tax. Deal with, deal with capital gains tax. Companies are making billions of dollars or millions and hundreds of millions of dollars in profits. What is their contribution? What is their contribution to the adjustment process, Madam President? But we are hearing that, for instance, everybody is playing, and the, the minister is doing his best to have an equitable distribution across the society as it relates to the burdens of adjustment. The burdens of adjustment is being weighed heavily on the shoulders of those least able to carry the, the burden. That is the point I'm making. And you cannot continue that way. And you expect us to come here and, 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 and support you? How can we support you? Social justice is not achievable without fiscal justice. I want to repeat that. Social justice is not possible or achievable, Madam sure. President, sure. without fiscal justice. You cannot take advantage of the ordinary people through these backward, reactionary, right-wing, conservative policies. That is the road that you are on. Where is the balance? My, my honorable colleague, the Minister of Labor, she's trying. She's trying. But I want to tell the honorable Minister of Labor, she should move with post haste and bring to this parliament an amendment to the Retrenchment and Severance Benefits Act. And forget consultation. You, you, I would ask the minister to meet with the tripartite committee, indicate this is important, and get the support, and bring this legislation to the parliament. You will have the support of the PP, and the UNC, and the COP on that measure, Madam President. Right. So, Madam President, we are very, very disappointed with this midterm or mid-year review. This mid-year review is designed to put more pressure on the ordinary people, on the poor, on the vulnerable, and on the middle class in particular. You want to impose a 7% um, levy on online purchases. When the former governor of the central bank told you who had been taking all the monies out of the foreign exchange system, what did you do about it? Bussy truth. you bossy truth. <laughs> Madam, uh, Madam President, I'm going he didn't, he didn't bust his throat. He, 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 in a very sophisticated way, dismissed him. <laughs> but you know, Madam President, you know, coming to say ordinary middle class people who are doing online shopping because there are merchants in this country who are ripping off poor people. Something that you could pay $10 for in the United States, they charge you for 
$150 for the same $10. So people want choices, Madam President, but you now want to inflict a 7% levy on this country. Madam President, I want to ask the Minister of Trade, what, should, what, what, what is the Minister of Trade doing about the current um, account? I saw in the Central Bank Bulletin where they are predicting at the end of 2016 fiscal 2016, there's going to be a minus 2.5 on our current account. It means that we are importing more than we are exporting. What is the Minister of Trade doing in terms of our trade policies to get more goods out there so we can earn more foreign exchange? What is, what is the Honorable Minister doing? I want to tell you, Madam President, the current account gives you a reflection of the economic health of a country. It is the balance of trade. And if you have a deficit emerging over and over, Madam President, you are going to be in trouble. So the Minister of Trade, instead of crying, should be standing up and doing what she's supposed to do in, an, in the interest of the people of this country. Madam President, I want to warn the Honorable Minister of Finance. You see savings, the Heritage and Stabilization Fund? We want to serve warning on him and his government that we will mobilize the country. We will mobilize the country if you dip into the Heritage and Stabilization Fund. If you go and put your hands into the people's savings, to deal with recurrent expenditure, we will mobilize the country against you. I think that we will need to have a general election long before five years. If you continue, we are going. <laughs> Madam President, if they continue how they are going, we will have to call through mass mobilization and organized action against this government a general election in this country so that the people can take them out. This government fooled the country. Mama guide the people. And Madam President, in closing, let me tell you something. The biggest con job ever perpetrated against the population of this country was by the PNM when they told the country they're going to reduce VAT from 15% to 12.5%. And they never told the country they were going to widen the base for these goods and services. Had they told the country that, Madam President, they would have never been elected by the people. So they pull a con job on the people of this country. Madam President, we are here. We represent hope for the people of this country. True. We are the alternative government, True. and we will not stand idly by and allow this government to undermine the rights and the freedoms and the democracy of oh, this country and the people. Oh, if they want confrontation, if they want collision, they will get confrontation, they will get collision, because we will not stand idly by and allow this government to undermine our democracy and our freedom and the people of this country, Madam President. They are not operating in the interest of the people. They are not consulting with the people. And they are doing things as they please. They don't care. And those who can't hear will we'll feel see. the weight of the people at the appropriate time. I thank you very much, Madam President. Senator Small. Thank you very much, Madam President, for giving me the opportunity to join. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, there's no way, Madam President, that I can I can even attempt to follow the passion of my of my erstwhile colleague on the on the opposition benches. But 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 before I begin, Madam President, it's important. I think that the the tone set by the minister, Honourable Minister of Finance this morning, I was a very sober tone, because I think. The magnitude or the depth, depending on which we, of, of the challenge that the government is facing, I am not sure if everybody fully appreciates it. The depth of the problem facing the government is huge, and the government's options for, for dealing with this are, are limited. They are limited. And if we don't want to accept that, then we need to, to be doing something else in another place. So that, that is my perspective with greatest respect, Madam President. Madam President, we've been over the past few months, as the government has started to roll out various measures, as, as outlined here, I, I think the minister very clearly indicated, the honorable minister very clearly indicated that while the bill deals with expenditure, we can look at it in a vacuum, 
and he needs to understand what the revenue what what the revenue situation is. Part of the, the message going out to the public is about we keep hearing the words tighten the belts. And the, 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 the problem is there's a level of cynicism in the public environment. As I often share in this on this in this August chamber, I'm a regular normal person and I live in a regular normal community. And there's, there's challenges that people have. You know, when you try to process that a lot of people in this country live what we call month to month. If their salary is one day late or two days late, they, their, home, their home life is in crisis. It's, they're in crisis. And it's, it's so that, but, but there needs to be an appreciation for, the, for what I described. The successive administrations have made policy choices, but what they've not done is fully put on the table what the cost of those policy choices are. And, and that, is, that, that is my bone of contention. So I believe, Madam President, I've listened very well to the Honorable Minister of Finance today and in the other place. And I believe that the government has started a process of making the necessary economic changes to align our expected rev expenditure with our revenues. But the, as the Minister of Finance clearly indicated, there's still a large gap as we sit. The, the challenge, Madam President, is that the outlook for energy revenues based on the current projection that I have looked at, suggests that for the next 12 to 24 months, we'll continue to experience relatively low energy prices, and that has a direct impact on government revenues. I believe that the Honorable Finance Minister of Finance is doing his best to hold things together and hoping that the situation improves. The issue, of course, is what if it doesn't? What if it doesn't improve? Madam President, I want to just quickly talk about the, the oil sector as it's, it's one of the, unfortunately for me, I, it's an it's a area where I spend a lot of my time. We have a challenge in the country with oil production. Oil production is, is in the doldrums, and the, 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 the biggest potential for us right now, given the existing portfolio, is within the trade my assets. The problem with the trade my assets is that the, the company Petrotrain is strapped for cash. And then there's a challenge with even trying to find someone who's willing to come in. There's other issues around the, the, the partnering, and then there's been, we all are aware of the issues in South Wales, so that would, a lot of things have happened, bad things that have happened, but we need to try and find a way to get those assets working for us. When we talk about natural gas, I think I, I had a conversation earlier this morning with the Honourable Minister of Energy, he was here earlier, and it's clear that the natural gas situation is getting better in terms of managing the, the shortfall situation, the BP, Geo, Juniper, the EOG, things are coming on, on schedule late 2017, early 2018. And I, as I, was, I saw in the other place, the Honorable Minister indicated that the Centrica assets in particular, the, 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 the PSC has been assigned to a new operator, and that is going to hopefully come on in 2018, early 2018. So that it's, it's not a huge, big, single, large field, but little, that, that will make the difference. The, the, the big exploration excitement that we have in the country, and I am very excited about the BHP <coughs> deep water campaign. I think it represents the one opportunity for us to find large resources more or less in one place. But here's the challenge, Madam, Madam President. BHP is supposed to start the work later this year, I understand in a, in a couple of months. But if BHP hits a big find on day one, well, they won't hit it on day one. Technically, it, takes a, it will take a few weeks for them to hit. But let's say by the end of the year, they hit a big find. The production for that will not start until around 2024. We're in 2016, so that we, there, there's yeah, six to eight years. Yeah, the production will not start until around 2024. So that we have a gap that in the meantime, while we, if everything works and that happens, we have to manage in that gap period. The Honorable Minister of Finance would know that as everybody who's following the number should work, from the beginning of the fiscal year in October to, to yesterday, WTI, the, the market crude for our, for our product, averaged about $37, $38 a barrel. 37. I have 37 also. Yeah. I looked this morning at the Energy Information Administration short-term energy, short-term market outlook dated April 12, 2016. That's today. They forecast that crude will average $40 through 2016 and $45 by the end of 2017. I've looked this morning, Madam President, at the, the wonderful NYMEX forward curve. When you look at the NYMEX forward curve, as of last Friday, 
They're projecting that oil will not get to probably about $45 till about the middle of 2018. So right now, all of the, all of the, well, I, I might know on Friday, so forgive me, Madam Honorable Minister, that what I'm sharing is that the outlook for prices is not something that gets anybody very excited. Yeah? The, the, one thing, the one thing that works for us is that, well, at least for the industry, the industry is hopeful that because the demand for oil continues to increase, this is, this is the, the fundamental strength of the, the, the industry, that the demand for oil is increasing. Oil oil demand in 2014 was 91.4 million barrels per day. In 2015, it was 92.9 million barrels a day. So the demand for oil is increasing. The problem is not keeping pace with the, the addition to supply. What, what is required for the market to come back into equilibrium is for the, there to be a reduction in the supply. And the OPEC partners have, have a meeting, I think, on the 17th of this month in a few days from now. That could be important. But here's, here's what's interesting. I was reading in the Financial Times yesterday morning an, an article dated, uh, entitled OPEC's Economic Power is Broken, uh, an uh, article by Daniel Yogeni, Financial Times, April 11, 2016. And I quote, he says, the era of OPEC as a decisive force in the world economy is over. And the, the thesis for that is that because OPEC has for the first time had somebody or, or, or an organization or a group that is challenging their power in the market, they don't know how to respond. They've never had to deal with that. And because they don't know how to, to respond, they're in disarray. And if they're in disarray, the party that has always been able to intervene in the oil markets and bring some kind of order to the oil markets is no longer that is able to do it. What it means is that the market will become even more unpredictable, even more uncontrollable. So, Madam President, quickly, I have a few things I want to touch during my short talk here. The, it's interesting when we, we always talk about the shale, and just one number I just want to put on the record is that while, if you look at the drilling numbers for, for, for drilling rigs in the USA, the, the drilling rig numbers dropped significantly. But your, United States oil production was 12.9 million barrels in 2014, but it was 14 million barrels in 2015. So that this year is actually forecast to, to, to cut back to about 13.6 million barrels today because the low prices is starting to have the effect. And that is where everyone is hoping that a lot of the, the, the loss in supply counts on the US and it can impact the market to bring the market into more or less equilibrium. That is what we're hoping. If OPEC and Russia and the other parties get together next week and work out, work out a deal, then perhaps that may happen sooner rather than later. But I wouldn't bet on it at this point in time. But then, President, I want to quickly talk about, talk about the gas market. I think that <clears throat> I've heard all sorts of things about Atlantic, and I have a particular view that I've shared on more than one occasion here. And I have, a, I have a proposed recommendation for the Minister of Finance in a couple of minutes. Atlantic shipped 91, uh, forgive me, not, last year Atlantic shipped 12 million tons of LNG. 9.1 of that went to the Americas, just about 78% of its cargoes. But here's what. The Honorable Minister of Finance laid it out. The market price of LNG has collapsed. And what has been interesting is that there's no, whereas the, right now in the Argentina, Brazil, and even the JKT countries, the, market, the price is around $5.50 $5 per million BTU. That is, that is just unbelievably low for, for LNG. And what is interesting is that whereas there used to be a, a, an opportunity to have arbitrage between the, the Americas and the Asian markets, the prices have all converged. And the prices have converged because there's just so much supply. The market is oversupplied. You have a situation where last year 14 million tons of LNG was, was added to the market. This year it's forecast that 42 million tons will also go into the market. So we have a situation where the outlook again for LNG prices is going to be controlled or, or, or re likely remain very low because of the fact that the market is also oversupplied. <coughs> I think that these are the things that are important about the market. When you look at what's happening in the US with Chenier, Chenier is also, good, is also going to be part of the 42 million tons. And at the end of the day, Madam President, is that we have to figure out what do we do. If we understand and we accept that the oil prices are going to be likely moderating, 
and we have and the and the prices earned by by natural for natural gas in the international international market are going to be moderate, going to be relatively low. What do we do? I think in the other place, the Honourable Minister of Finance mentioned that several other countries who have heritage and stabilisation funds have or sovereign wealth funds have dipped into those funds to balance their budgets. But the, the issue also is that those countries have also undertaken other activities. It's not just dipping into the, the, the wealth funds. So, so that they've tried to figure out ways now to reshape the economy. And that, that, that is what we need to do. So Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia has, has said, listen, what they're going to do, they're going to do an IPO with the Saudi Aramco, and they're going to put about 5% of the company in an, in an IPO. <coughs> But what they're going to do with the rest, the government of, of Saudi Arabia has recognized that for the longer term, for them to really survive, they're going to be pledging, because Aramco is totally owned by the state, they're going to be pledging the majority share of the government stake into, into a sovereign wealth fund, into a new fund. That they, and the, the way it's going to work is going to be the assets of Saudi Aramco will be able to back investments that they make overseas. And it's, it's something similar to the way in which the China Investment Corporation works. And these are things for countries who have huge, huge funds. We have to find other ways. But what I'm saying is, is that we have to recognize that even those who have a lot have, have a cushion are trying to figure out ways to survive any longer too. So Madam President, as I wrap that section of my talk, I think we, I, I, I would posit that we are in for a lengthy period of moderate crude and gas prices. I think we also have to accept that there's a low probability of the other sector, sectors making up the slack in the short to medium term. And you, I, have, I will look at the data shortly, I'll talk about that. Scaling back public expenditure is mandatory. There needs to be scaling back of public expenditure. We need to sharpen the pencil on that. Deficit budgets, we should try to avoid like the plague. I understand the, the short term challenge now, especially with some, some pressure for some payments, but we need to, we need to fix that. Madam President, we keep hearing about the diversification agenda. And that is an ongoing challenge in Trinidad and Tobago. Because it's, the, it's, it's a challenge because the subsidies and tax system that we have make it very difficult for us to really meaningfully pursue diversification. That is the reason it hasn't worked before. And it's because it is just too easy to be profitable, quote unquote, in Trinidad and Tobago. You can, depending on, on the type of business you are in, because of how the system is set up with the subsidies and the, and the, and the, the very low corp, and, the very, it, and these things are business friendly. But what it does, it has, a, it has a limited effect on wanting to do something unique or different because it's very easy to come and do business as usual and be very profitable. So th there needs to be a, a balance there. And Madam President, I, I, I noted in the document in the presentation made by the Honorable Minister of Finance in the other place, where he indicated that energy exports, I think for 2015, were just about $7.5 billion. I'm looking at some data from the Central Bank here. And when you look at non-energy exports, over the past, from 2007 to now, none of the highest year, when you had the highest number for non-energy exports, was in 20, 2012 with $2.4 billion. So, we all have to try to restructure the economy and we have to diversify. But when you look at non-energy exports, the highest it's ever been, it's $2.4 billion. It, 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 it brings to bear the magnitude of the challenge we are facing as a country. And it's not that they can't do it, but the <coughs> gap is so huge to be filled that because of the, the shortfall in oil and, oil and gas revenues, that gap is huge and that is not going to happen in the short and medium term. It doesn't mean that we stop but it probably means that we need to accelerate the activities to get the non-energy sector going. Madam President, I want to talk quickly about the subsidy. I believe that that has been very well ventilated. And I think that the issues are that the fuel subsidy is something that has been, is, a, is largely an inheritance from previous administrations at a time when the country was in, had better economic circumstances. I support the move to, to, to reduce the subsidy or, or eliminate it altogether and put in place a system where people pay the prices based on what the market price is. And I mean, just for example, you, you look at, I looked at the, the same United States Energy Information Administration outlook this morning and I saw that the average 
gasoline price, super gasoline price in North America. The average price today is three dollars and fifteen cents a gallon. It will excuse me? No, sorry, three dollars and fifteen cents a liter. A liter. A liter. I, I did the conversion. I, so I have their data. I have their data. And I've con I converted it into TT dollars. So their regular price for, for, for their price for regular fuel is cheaper than ours now. By comparison, in 2015 it was four dollars, and in 2014 it was five dollars and sixty cents, equivalent. And it just speaks to the fact that as the crude price has gone, the products prices have come down. That's all it speaks to. So that I think that we need to understand that the subsidy is something when you look at. We, we, if you rule this discussion up, Madam President, we, we talk about being sustainable in the things that we're doing. And, we, and the question is, and I always ask, how sustainable is it for us to continue with these subsidies at this scale? And, and, I, and, I, and I, I am of the view that the pain has to be, has to be applied, if, if you want to put it that way, but we have to be serious about trying to see what we can do for Trinidad and Tobago. I, and, and, and while we... While we, while we recognize that there's going to be an effect across the board, I'm also of the view that those who could pay more should pay more. And I will come, I will come to that shortly. Madam President, we talk about the fuel subsidy because it's a number that is quantified often. But do we understand what is the electricity subsidy? Are citizens aware that there's an electricity subsidy? And this, 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 is, this is another issue. And, and I, am, I want to be clear. I am not here trying to say that the government should immediately raise electricity prices. What I'm saying is that these are policy choices that have been made by the government of the day. And, but we need to also make, when we make those policy choices, quantify it so that citizens can understand what it means. So I will give a little calculation. Minister of Finance, Honorable, do not, I will not put the actual numbers. I will use some notional numbers, but it will be enough to guide. According to the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries data, and for 2015, an average of 295 million cubic feet per day of gas went to power generation. If we assume, if we assume that gas for power generation is sold at less than something called the National Gas Company's weighted average cost of gas. What the NGC does, it buys gas from different suppliers at different prices, different terms, but they come up with a, with a weighted average cost of gas to the company. If we assume that the price that they sell gas for power at is lower than their weighted average cost, which is a fact. I can, I can say that that's pretty much a fact. The Honorable Minister is shaking his head, agreeing. Okay, forgive me. I, I mean no disrespect on our minister. <laughs> so work with my calculation, Madam President. Let's say that gas electricity is less than NGC's weighted average cost by a dollar million BTU. Then the daily cost of that subsidy is 295,000 US, or 1.9 million TT a day, or 700 million TT a year. And if this looks much worse, if we consider the opportunity cost of using that gas for something like ammonia. So that, let's assume again that if some of that gas could have gone to ammonia and the difference in price between what NGC gets for the gas for power as opposed to selling it to ammonia is $3 a million BTU, then the revenue, the revenue lost comes to an annual total of $2 billion. Absolutely. So that we live in a place and we do not understand the extent to which the government has, all, it has been subsidizing our lives. And, that, and at subsidizing it at these numbers is not sustainable. It is not. We are, as a citizen, it, will, it may cost us, we may feel some pain, but we have to recognize that this level cannot, cannot continue. So that, Madam President, what I am suggesting is that if through energy efficiency and conservation, we can even capture 10% of this, that would transit to $200 million additional for the Minister of Finance or whoever party. And I think that this is something that we need to look at. And all I'm saying is when policy choices are, are out there, citizens must be fully informed about what is the cost of those policy choices. So that when the government says, whoa, this is actually costing $2 billion a year and we can't afford that, we have to raise it and these citizens have the information. 
And I'm, I'm, I, I forgive me for putting this type of information in the public, but this is what people need to know so that when the government comes with, with, with measures, people have a better grasp of, of what is going on. So, Madam President, I have a couple of recommendations to the Minister of Finance. You can't, I will lay them, on, 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 lay them out. I think that with serious consideration must be given to adjusting over time, adjusting over time the electricity tariffs to at least reflect the NGC's weighted average cost, of, cost of, of gas. Over time, it can't happen. I think that this has a multiple benefits. One, it will force users to be more efficient in the use of electricity. Two, it will also re obviously reduce the subsidy that the government is paying, but also, importantly for the things that are going on in the, in the macro sector, it reduces what I call the leverage of certain large upstream companies that frequently suggest that because they provide cheap gas electricity, they, it entitles them to broad incentives that actually hurt our energy tax base. And, and so that these are things that I feel very passionately about because we need to be forthright and have the, the, the blunt, these, these times called for blunt discussions. In time for niceties, hello nicety, but we need more money. I hear you. I hear you. Madam President, I want us to get serious with energy efficiency. This chamber and this building are good examples crying out for help. The AC is always on, my, my fingers are almost numb, and, and so are the lights. So I'll warm them up. <laughs> Madam President, I ask, what is the cost of retrofit timers and motion sensors to the lighting controls so that we can conserve electricity? Every government ministry and department should be mandated to evaluate the cost, its, its, energy, its cost of energy consumption and come up with strategies to reduce it by at least 10% <coughs> in, in the next 60 days. I do not feel if every ministry has a, a facilities manager, you can work out a strategy to say, listen, we need the AC off of this hour, we need the lights off, and you will be surprised at how, at how, how it, it, it adds up. And this is well tested in the EU. Certainly, and I, I am, I, I, perhaps I travel too often. I go to, I go to all foreign countries. I go to meetings. When the meeting room is closed, and you walk in the room, the lights come on. Otherwise the, room, otherwise, the room is dark because the cost of electricity is high. For the future, Madam President, for the future, the government has to really go back to look at, at gas-fired air conditioning. Gas fire air conditioning will, 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 if, when, and that would have to be at the design phase, but for a building complex such as this, gas fire air conditioning has the, you have the, up, the, the, the ability to throttle the, the performance of the unit. You need more AC in the day, you need less in the night. With an electricity powered unit, it just has to keep working, especially in this building where the thermostats are shut. With a gas fired unit, you can also capture the waste heat and you can turn that into, into to, to, to hot water and even do a small, small generation facility to have emergency backup power. So there's technology out there, for certainly for the future. I would say that, Madam, Madam President, I would suggest that the government to remove all taxes, all duties on solar water heaters, and, and for a period, three years, five years, to get that part of the, let's remove, make it completely tax free. Remove it. Remove, as the Honorable Minister of Finance, I said remove all taxes. I said remove all taxes, duties on OEM, OEM, C, CNG, maxi taxis for at least three to five years. Remove them and allow parties, because people would have bought maxis over a period of time and maybe still have installments to pay. But when it's time to, re, to change that, allow them to be able to bring in a CNG maxi for, without any, at, at the cost. We have to try to find ways to cut these costs. All AGC properties, should have a free change out of the energy efficient light bulbs. Energy efficient light bulbs, there's other issues with fluorescent light bulbs, but where we are, we, we have to work out ways to conserve electricity. Madam President, why does every ministry and every department need a $500,000 vehicle to, to move mail and documents? Burning diesel, why? Government should, at the time when vehicles require change out, Government should invest in a fleet of OEM, CNG, and hybrid vehicles for all ministries and departments. There's no, absolutely zero need for every single ministry and department to be driving a half million dollar diesel guzzling vehicle to deliver mail. It does not, it, there's no economics in that. Yes. 
Madam President, I move quickly now to one of my other areas I want to talk, where when the minister, the Honorable Minister is speaking about revenues, he also has to look at way, places where there's been hemorrhage of revenues. And I have this little section entitled, Errant State Enterprises. Madam President, I, I, I am fortunate to be as part of this parliament, a member or chairman of our committee on state enterprises. And, and, I, and, I, and the committee has begun a process where several state enterprises have been delinquent in submitting their reports to the parliament by, as, as required by law. And I would say to this parliament, by the, certainly by the end of this term, every enterprise under our, under our purview will be up to date to their records. We, we, we've made it mandatory. There's no, no flexibility. We still have a challenge, Madam President, with the audited financials. And I am actually scared, Madam President, about what will be revealed when those accounts for all those other entities are brought up to date. Madam President, last week, I sat on a, on a committee here, and an entity reported, showed its accounts. It showed that in, th in this year, it lost $99 million. And then when they, they did a restatement of their accounts in the next year, the loss moved from $99 million to $562 million. A $460 million change in losses. And the people gathered in front of the committee had no answers. Why? Because we are looking at 2009 accounts. And you can't blame anybody sitting across from me because none of them were there. Madam President, and I do not want to be, to be disruptive, but I, I have a theory, and I want to say, Madam President, it's a theory. The, I, I have a theory that there's a pattern of, of behavior or misbehavior where entities dither, D-I-T-H-E-R, dither, on providing timely audited financials with the sure knowledge that by the time someone picks up the malfeasance, the, the bird has flown the coop. But Madam President, remember, that is just a theory. It's a theory. All we can ask now is, where the money going? That's all we could ask. Madam President, and I, I want to, I want to just dive, dive, diverge for one second because I understand the Honourable Prime Minister is attending something called the Anti-Corruption Summit in the UK, and 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 this is timely because it will be the first summit of its kind, and it's and it's bringing together world leaders to agree on a practical, a series of practical steps too. And I want to quote from their website: One, expose corruption so there's nowhere to hide. Two. And this is a missing link in Trinidad and Tobago. Punish the perpetrators and support those affected by corruption. Punish the perpetrators. Punish the perpetrators. Dry and tree, drive all the culture of corruption where it exists. And, and while it may be a, a first measure, this anti-corruption summit, I want to remind members that there was a, a prime minister of the UK called John Tony Blair, forgive me, who started something called the EITI. And when he started that, where are we now? Trinidad and Tobago is now praised as one of the, the, the best performing countries under the EITI. We became members. So sometimes things have a, a, a beginning that is relatively humble, and then they morphed into, 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 I hope that this follows a similar path. Because we have a problem with corruption. Because Madam President, I'm on record here in this house as saying corruption doesn't exist. Not until somebody cuts a jail on a regular basis for stealing government funds, taking food from the plates of the poor people in this country to enrich themselves. And until that happens, corruption doesn't exist. It's not real. I see I have 10 more minutes. So, I want to deal with one other recommendation, Madam President. I want the Minister, Honorable Minister of Finance to consider, and the Honorable Minister of Energy to consider. Expose, put the data in the public about what have been the revenues of Atlantic LNG and then what have been the, the government's take from those revenues. Madam President, I, I have put a calculation on the record in this parliament more than once. And I, and I, have, shown, I, have, I have shown a calculation where when, certainly when LNG prices were higher, Atlantic LNG's gross revenues were around 60 to $65 billion. What was the government take in those years? And, 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 and I know there's confidentiality issues, but we need to build a case to understand that 
a, there's an agency, a company here doing the bidding of its shareholders, which is their right, and, and I have no problem with that. They're protecting the interests of their shareholders, but they're also using 75 or 80 percent of our gas, and we are not getting 75 or 80 percent of the revenues. So there's a huge disconnect, and we need to find a way to have that conversation. So, Madam President, I, Minister Finance is also aware that the, 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 the contract for the supply of gas Atlantic LNG train one is coming up for review. I have a simple recommendation. One, stop the direct sale of gas to, to, to LNG from by BP and BG. Stop it. And second, give NGC control, the National Gas Company, control of the gas allocation to, these, to, 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 to train one in the first instance. And allow the NGC to implement a pricing model that gives the state better control and access to the greater, to a greater share of the LNG sales revenue. And how you do that, Madam President, is that you, you have to, for the NGC in particular, because they have, their, they have their own issues, you have to segregate, be able to segregate or, or ring fence those revenues in a special purpose entity within the NGC and allow 100% return, less admin expenses, to the state, not, not, not dividends. Have a 100% return to the state on a quarterly basis so that Minister of Finance gets this money in more, more of a real time rather than the Honorable Minister of Finance have to write a letter seeking dividends. We can have a separate discussion with ministers is interested, but I believe this is one of the things we must do. We must find a way to increase the rents from, from this. Madam President, there's been lots of talk about the GATE program. I, I would be remiss if I didn't say I think it needs review. At the time when I was a, I had an Afro, Madam, Madam President, and I, and I wanted to do tertiary level studies. I had an Afro, I had an Afro comb, I had everything. <laughs> a, a little while ago, I had to take, take, I had to take a bank loan to, go, to do my tertiary studies. And I paid it on my own. And I'm not saying that because I, I paid everybody I should pay. It. But we've reached a stage of the program, I think the program needs review. And I will come back to the argument of sustainability, Madam President. In the UK, for example, the government of the United Kingdom will lend any eligible student money to pay for their tertiary studies. But graduates, once they've completed their studies, are required to begin repaying the loan. There's a minimum threshold salary that you must earn before the government can start to, start to get money from you. But the system is progressive, so as, as soon as, as you start to earn more, the repayments numbers increase. Madam President, the question I want to ask, perhaps it is time we consider whether free tertiary education with no commitment to repay or give back service to the government, is it sustainable? Where, is it sustainable? And I'm not saying take it away, perhaps we need to figure out a new way to structure the program, but I do not believe that it is currently structured. We can continue ad infinitum to pay for tertiary education, and there's no repayment to the state or no service to the state. It is either one or the two or both. So that I think we need to have a, a, a different discussion about how we manage the gate program going forward. And if Madam President, can you tell me how much time I have again, Madam President? Thank you very much, Madam President. I, I have a couple of the little, little things I want to talk about. Madam President, I mentioned corruption. It doesn't exist. CLECO, HCU, FCB, IPO, all of those things have gone silent. Nobody has been brought to bear to face any sort of justice in this matter. And the state, I'm looking at line items, repayment of HCU bonds, and I'm saying that is coming out of the taxpayers' money but the perpetrators, ask Alan Stanford and Raj Rajanatnam, what is the meaning of, of corruption? Because I understand right now they're, they're very, very well taken guests of the United States Department of Corrections. They're very, and, and they'll be guests of the United States Department of Corrections for several years to come. That is what you, you're supposed to do when you run a Ponzi scheme, you rip off people, and then the government has to stand in, come in and bail out. But people are living fat in, in Florida or wherever, living, living well, and there's no penalties, and there's no, and it's not only this Alan Stanford and Roger, they don't just incarcerate you, they seize your assets. Because at the end of the day, when people steal, they, they accumulate wealth to get things. All the government in the United States and other countries, oh, you want the money, we take what money, and then we take the things. So we need, we need to figure out a way to deal with that, because this, this that is going on here is too long, too far. I, I look at the Central Bank Economic Bulletin, and I'm seeing the gap between 
deposit and, and, and savings rates is about 8%. I understand the Honourable Minister of Finance made a comment a few weeks ago in the newspaper that he has some leeway in the matter. I beg the indulgence. Every time we are asking the citizens to, the government is asking the citizens to bear with the government, tighten your belt, well, give the citizens something. Tell the banks this spread, 8%, is too high. You are robbing people. Tell the banks, I, as the Minister of Finance, I'm asking you to say, listen, could you, could you do something about this in the way in which citizens can get some benefit? And within his own control, the Honorable Minister of Finance, there's something called tax-free savings bonds. I've advocated for that. Every, every session of this parliament since I've been here, where are they? As a citizen, I have zero ability for my savings to earn. And there's something that while we ask citizens to tighten, the government can say, well, perhaps we can help citizens save and earn something on their savings. My last issue I want to talk about, well, two, I have two more. Madam President, I am a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. I have a passport that says I'm a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. My driver's permit says I'm a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. Great. When I want to go to Tobago, there's an issue. Because I can't go to Tobago when I want, and I certainly can't leave. If I'm in Tobago, I can't leave Tobago when I want. I, as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, should have unfettered access to, my, to, my, to, to the wonderful Pigeon Point Beach or Black Rock or wherever I, I choose to go. And when I get to there, I should be able to get on a flight. Why are we having this problem, Madam President? It's because of the structure. We are asking Caribbean Airlines to provide a service, but not to lose money. So they are up, they're try, and you, you, you're trying to provide a, an essential service, but keep it from losing money. It's, it's economically, it's, it's at odds. What is happening is that the, the, the factor of trying not to lose money is, is pulling this way, and the service is going this way. And that's all that's happening. It can't, I, I, I Try to avoid going to Tobago now, because when I have a meeting sometime in Port of Spain and I need to be back, I don't want to be airport the airport the plane late. I can't. And I, have, I don't have people to call to help me get on planes. I have one more minute. Thank you very much, Madam President. Let me wrap up. Madam President, I want to wrap by saying this. I am a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, and I'm proud to be a citizen. I make every, every day I wake up, Madam President, Madam President, I make my peace with the Father. I thank him for, for giving me health. I try it on every day to come to do do right by Trinidad and Tobago. The country is in a, in a situation where we have an unprecedented oil and gas market scenario that I challenge anyone to say that this is an easy waters to navigate. These are difficult, difficult waters. We need people to really stop the, the noise and let's focus on the issues and see how we can rally around Trinidad and Tobago. This is our country. And we should really, at this point in time, recognize that these problems are so large that require everybody to get behind the government and try to see how we could best work together to make sure that Trinidad and Tobago has a sustainable future going forward for me, for you, for everyone else, and for our children and our families. Madam President, with those few words, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak. So at this point, we will suspend for the lunch break and we will resume at 1.30 p.m. so that this sitting is now suspended until 1.30.